uh, remind you of what we are doing. We are looking at, in a large part, at the idea of right view on the Buddhist path, uh, different ways of thinking about the world, different ways of um, relating to the world around us in such a way that it gives rise to this uh, spiritual path. If you look at the world in the right way, it's like the spiritual path almost comes out of that. It emerges out of the idea of looking at the world in the right way. If we think about the world in the wrong way, then there is no spiritual path because we are only interested in worldly things. But if we think about the world in the way the Buddha thought about it, this is what we mean by right view, by actually understanding all of these various aspects and the spiritual path just happens. It's almost as if you don't have to do anything. It just happens by itself. It's a very powerful idea, this idea of right view. I'm going to have a look at one more sutta which talks about right view before we move on to actually looking at the meditation itself. And this last sutta is about views themselves, how to relate to views. Because this is a very important part of life. Everyone has we all have views about things, yeah. Views about which religion is best, what kind of politics you follow, what kind of whatever. We have views about ourselves, who we are, and all of these kind of things. Uh. So how we relate to views is actually very important. Uh. So this is this last sutta. So let's have a look. I'll bring up the share the screen with you again. And uh, <clears throat> here it is. Uh, this is the. Uh, Sutta on Views. So uh, this is called the Eight on Malice. And uh, it's called Eight because Eight is the Eight Verses. Uh, yeah, And then you have on Malice because uh, basically it starts off with someone who has a bad intent. That's kind of the beginning here. Uh, so uh, I'll uh, read this out for you. And then I will do as I always do. I will comment on each of these uh, verses. Uh, as we uh, afterwards. Uh, so this is how it goes. Uh, some speak with malicious intent, while others speak set on truth. Uh, when disputes come up, a sage does not get involved, uh, which is why they have no barrenness at all. Uh, how can you transcend your own view uh, when you are led by preference, dogmatic in belief? Uh, Inventing your own ideas, you speak according to those ideas. Some, unasked, tell others of their own precepts and vows. They have an ignoble nature, say the experts, since they speak about themselves of their own accord. A mendicant, peaceful, quenched, never boasts Thus am I of their precepts. They have a noble nature, say the experts, not proud of anything in the world. For one who formulates and creates teachings and promotes them despite their defects, if they see an advantage for themselves, they become dependent on that, relying on unstable peace. It is not easy to get over dogmatic views, adopted after judging among the teachings. That is why among all the dogmas, a person rejects one teaching and takes up another. The cleansed one has no formulated view at all in the world about the various realms. Having given up illusion and conceit, by what path would they go? They are not involved. For one who is involved gets embroiled in dispute about teachings. But how to dispute with one who is not involved? About what? For picking up and putting down is not what they do. They have shaken off all views in this very life. So what does this mean? <laughs> It's a, little bit, it's a little bit strange and maybe a little bit, I'm sure you can get some of the ideas here. Some of the ideas are going to be fairly obvious. Yeah, the idea of holding on to views leading to disputes. We know that is true. Yeah, we 
argue about views, we argue about opinions in the world. Uh, but um, let us have a look at each verse in turn and see if we can draw out some of the meaning of this, because it is maybe a little bit obscure. Huh? So it starts off by talking about the distinction about some people who speak with malicious intent uh, and others that speak set on truth. Uh, yeah. And uh, the idea is that um, many people in the world, when we speak, we have, an, we have some extra, we have some, uh, uh, the reason we speak is for some other purpose than actually finding the truth. Uh, yeah, we speak because we want to be right. Uh, we speak because we want to convince other people. Uh, so maybe malicious is not the best word here. It is more like a corrupted intent. Uh, corrupted in the sense that we actually want to get something out of the speaking, not just because we want to talk about the truth. But the person who is really, who understands the value of speech, understands the value of truth in the world, the reason why they speak is always just to tell the truth. This is what the Buddha does. He says, this is the way the world is. Listen to me. I know I've seen this for myself. There is no... Um, other intention on the part of the Buddha. The Buddha doesn't do this because he wants to have more disciples. Yeah? The Buddha doesn't do this because he, he um, uh, somehow wants to impress other people. He certainly doesn't do it because he wants to be mal malicious. It's only because of truth. That is the only reason. Yeah? So this is already very beautiful. Yeah? It's very difficult to speak like this, always about truth, always about what is right, uh, never having any kind of extra intentions in these things. Uh, and uh, so it, it's a kind of starting point. And the reason why there is this difference, uh, the reason why people often come from the wrong place is because they have views. They want to build themselves up. They want to feel good about themselves. And that is part of the problem. So then it says, when disputes come up, a sage does not get involved. Yeah? If there is a dispute between people, someone who is a real sage, someone who is someone who is a noble person, they don't get involved in those disputes because they want to be about truth. They just want to teach the reality as it is. But they know that as soon as there is a dispute, it is no longer about truth. It is about who is right. It is about proving your point or whatever. But the sage, they don't want to prove their point. They just want to teach. And if you want to take it, take it. If you don't want to take it, well, that's your problem. And that is how the Buddha teaches in the world. And this is why they have no barrenness at all. And this may sound strange, yeah? The idea of barrenness, the Pali word is kila and uh, this is found in one of the suttas in the Majjhima Nikaya, the idea of the barrenness of the heart. The barrenness of the heart means when you have a lot of defilements in the heart, you are not really open to receiving the teachings. You're not open to develop the Dhamma in the right way. It is like the path becomes barren. The path doesn't lead to any results anymore because you're not really practicing the path at all. These are the things that block the development. Yeah. When we talk about barren, what we mean, it is something that has no fruit. Yeah, it has no result. We can talk about a barren field. A barren field is where there is no crops growing. The crops don't really have any, uh, there's no fruit being born. And that is why it is called barren. Huh? So uh, if we argue for the wrong reason, if we get involved in disputes, we become barren. Huh? The spiritual path doesn't make any progress anymore. There is no result for us. So the real sages of the world, they don't get involved in this way. How can you transcend your own view when you are led by preference, dogmatic in belief? Yeah, if we hold on to our views, if we grasp on to the way that we see the world, and we do that to some extent, yeah? Remember one of the very interesting things in dependent origination. Dependent origination says that from feeling you get craving. From craving you get the taking up. Yeah, you grasp onto things. And one of the things that we grasp onto is views. It's called the dit upadana, the grasping onto views. 
There's four upadanas, right? Independent origination. One is just the grasping onto the sensual pleasures of the world. Uh, one is grasping onto precepts and observances. Uh, and the last two are all about views. Uh, it's called the Atavad Upadana and Dit Upadana. It's about holding on to things. Uh, so as long as we have craving, uh, as long as we see the world in the wrong way, it is to be expected that we will grasp onto views. Uh, everyone does that. Uh, yeah? But the more powerfully you hold on to these views, uh, and we can release that grasping to some extent, or we can have hold really, really strongly, uh, the more powerfully you hold on to those views that you have about the world. Uh, yeah? Say that you are a Christian. Uh, if as a Christian you believe in God, uh, and it can be very difficult to have a discussion with a Christian person because the way they hold on to the idea of God is so strong. They're grasping onto that uh, because it satisfies some kind of feeling within and because it satisfies the feeling within that they are led by craving and that craving leads to those views. So it's very useful to remember that the more powerfully you hold on to your views, it becomes very hard to go beyond that view. And remember that from the Buddhist point of view, each one of us has wrong view to some extent. Yeah, none, none of us actually understands the world fully and correctly. And because we don't understand the world fully and correctly, it means that there's some degree of wrong view in each one of us. So never hold on to your views too strongly. If you hold on to your views too strongly, you're making it very hard to make the kind of progress that you want on this path. This is what this is about, the ability to transcend our ordinary views, to develop our views, to come closer and closer to the idea of the Buddha. This is what really uh, he's talking about here. And he says, inventing your own undertakings. And this just means inventing your own ideas. Yeah, Because very often our views that come from some kind of need inside of us, because we have a need within, that is where these views kind of emerge from. So it is almost as if they are invented by us. And then we speak according to those views. We speak according to those notions. Yeah, and this is where we often become embroiled in disputes, because this is my view, it is very important to you, it is very significant for you, it really matters. And because it matters to you, that is where the conflict arises. Yeah, so you speak according to those notions, but you don't really know what you're talking about. It is uncertain, it is not founded of some kind of truth that you have seen for yourself, and so it becomes problematic. So you can see a lot of the idea in this, uh, what we're talking about here, is that we should, when we have views about the world, uh, we should hold those views in a light way. We shouldn't grasp onto them, hold onto them as if they are very true or very important. Uh, but we should be careful with our views. Uh, yeah? And these are all kinds of views. You could say even your Buddhist views, yeah? even those Buddhist views that you may have may not be 100% correct. So don't grasp them too harshly. Don't hold on to them in a very strong way. Eh? Because if you do, you will not be able to develop further and go beyond that and see things even more clearly. Eh? This is the idea behind this. One of the very interesting things on the Buddhist path is precisely this idea, why is it that we hold on to views so strongly? Eh? And again, coming back to this idea of dependent origination, uh, you, would, you would know that the craving comes from feeling, yeah, and from that craving uh, then comes holding on to views afterwards. Uh, so what that means is that a lot of our holding on to views, uh, the reason we do that uh, is because it feels good to us. Uh, holding on to a view, having a view about a particular thing feels good. Uh, why is that the case? And the reason it is the case is because we already have a feeling that we exist. Yeah, we have a feeling that I am in a certain way. This is called Sakaya Ditti, the feeling of existing. So if you have a view that supports that feeling, if someone comes and says, you have a soul, yeah, you have an inherent essence, and when you die, you will go to God and you will hang out with God for the rest of eternity, 
you think, yeah, great, yeah, this is exactly what I feel. It feels like I exist in a certain way, and you tell me that there is a soul, so that you must be right about the soul, and because you're right about the soul, it means I will go to heaven afterwards, I will meet God, and I will enjoy the heavenly things forever after. So you can see that what happens here is that because you have a view about who you are, I exist, any kind of views that supports that basic idea that you exist within yourself, any view that supports that will feel good to you. Yeah, it will feel good because you already have the idea that you exist. So it is very easy for us to crave for views that support that deep inner intuition that we exist in a certain way. But what if that intuition is wrong? What if we haven't understood the world in the right way? And then you start to understand that actually you're just basing your views on feelings. They feel good to you. That's why you have those views. And this is kind of unpleasant, yes? Because usually when we have a views, we think that it's because it is rational. I have this view because it makes sense. We think of ourselves as rational beings. This is one of the things about being human. But when you start to understand that actually your views are very often not because of rationality, but because they feel good to you. That is why you have those views. If you start to see that, you start to see, wait a minute, that is not really satisfactory. Is that why I have these kind of views? And then when you start to see the nature of the development of views, you start to hold those views in a less strong way because you understand that they are unreliable. Feelings are unreliable, and because feelings are unreliable, the views that are based on those feelings also will be unreliable. And this is a beautiful way of loosening the grip of views a little bit, uh, understanding why we have these things. Uh, it is like when you grow up in life, yeah, and your parents treat you in a certain way, and they bring you up in a certain way. Uh, very often, many of our views when we are young, they come from our parents. Uh, and we then follow along with those views because it feels good. Going against your parents may be very difficult. It's easier to just follow along. So because you follow along, because it feels good to follow along, that's why you have those views. Not because of some kind of great intellectual insight or whatever. And a lot of things are like that. We have the same views as the people around us because it feels good and all of these kind of things. And the more you can see that, the more you can start to not hold those views so tightly. It's the same for us as Buddhists. Yeah, very often, even as Buddhists, you can hold on to views sometimes very powerfully. You can say, yeah, rebirth is right. Yeah, and if you think there's no rebirth, you are wrong about it. But actually, when you think about it, you know that that is just a belief for most of us. Okay, maybe if you had a near-death experience. If you had a near-death experience and you have some deeper insight into the nature of reality, okay, then maybe you have some evidence about the idea of rebirth. But for the majority of people, it is just something that you believe in. So you say, okay, I don't actually know. Let me not hold even this belief too strongly, or let me believe in it, but let, let me not argue about this, yeah? Because then you're really holding the belief in the wrong way. And this is how we then come to understand the how to deal with views in the right way, uh, not using it for argument, not using it to prove ourselves, uh, not using it because we have a need, but actually holding it lightly and gradually moving towards the view of the Buddha. Anyway, then the Buddha carries on uh, and he says, some people unasked, they tell others of their own precepts and vows. They have an ignoble nature, say the experts. So this is quite common, yeah, people will talk about their own things, talk about, you know, being good and be doing, living in a good way, being a Buddhist and practicing the sila and kind of doing acts of generosity and all of these kind of things, yeah. It is very common in our uh, Buddhist, Buddhist world and the whole world. Uh, 
And of course, the reason why we talk about these things is because we like to identify with the good side of our nature. Yeah, I am a good person. I'm living well. And so we like to talk about these things. But um, what you will notice is that if you talk about your own goodness, it is almost like you are polluting it a little bit. It reduces the happiness and the satisfaction you get from being kind, because it is almost as if you are putting a stain into that, into that goodness by talking about it. So that is why the experts, the experts here really are the good people. They are the noble ones. Yeah, the Pali word is kusala. And kusala means the good people. And the good people say you have an ignoble nature if you talk about these things, because there's no need to tell others about these things. It reduces the happiness that you get from these things. And so that this is one of the reasons why, you know, when you do an act of kindness and you uh, do an act of generosity why, or whatever it is, uh, there's no need to tell anyone else. Uh, there's no need to kind of write at the back of the book, this was given by so-and-so, because actually it reduces some of the satisfaction that you get from these things. Uh, and um, how is this related to views? Well, it is related to views. I'm not entirely sure, but it, it is related to the views in the sense that uh, it comes from this need, this ide identity that we have with things in the world, uh, whether it's precept and vows uh, or whether it is the views about the world. It comes from this deeper feeling that we need to feel good about ourselves. Then there's the opposite, yeah? A mendicant, a monastic, uh, uh, peaceful and quenched, uh, never boasts, uh, thus am I, of their precepts. Uh, they have a noble nature, said the good people, not proud of anything in the world. Uh, this is the ideal way of being. Yeah? Yeah, when you hear someone boast about their conduct, uh, or not even boasting, but just saying it yeah, out about their conduct, uh, it can feel a bit off-putting. Yeah? But when you can see that someone is a good person, you can tell just by the way they act, by the way they are living in the world, yeah? just by seeing their peaceful demeanor, by seeing the way they treat others with kindness, then it is very powerful. It is seeing that is believing. When you see something as being true, that is when it is powerful. Yeah? And this is the way I have always try. You look at other people and you make a judgment about them. You don't judge them from what they say because you know what people say in life is very uncertain. Yeah, you cannot really trust what people say because what we say and how we act often diverge. So it is the nature of a person. You decide by looking at them, whether they argue or whether they are difficult or whatever, not by how they say things. So uh, very often when we talk about our good qualities, actually it just detracts uh, from those good qualities. Uh, so then the Buddha carries on uh, and now we're coming back to the idea of uh, views again. Uh, and he says that for one who formulates and creates teachings, uh, these are dhammas, uh, the teachings that you make, uh, and you promote those teachings despite their defects. Uh, yeah, this can happen very often in the world if you have an idea or you have a view about something. And especially maybe if you are in the situation of being a teacher. Yeah? And once you have a teaching and you become attached to that teaching because you are creating it, yeah, then you may teach it even though you know it has downsides. Yeah? And that is kind of scary. And this is why very often in the world you get people who are teachers uh, and who promote things that are very bad and very harmful. Uh, you find all these gurus around the world. Uh, you find people who promote even theistic religions who don't really even believe what they are teaching. Yeah? But still, they formulate these teachings. Uh, and this is one of the great things about being a Buddhist who relies on the suttas. Because if you rely on the suttas, if you rely on the word of the Buddha, you're not really formulating any new teachings. You're taking the common core of Buddhism and we are presenting that to the best of our, our abilities. And then we kind of sidestep that trap of formulating your own teachings. There have been some interesting cases that you can sometimes read about 
in the world. And I remember, uh, uh, remember reading some time ago about how common it is, for example, within Christianity, uh, how common it is for the priests uh, not to believe in God. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's kind of astonishing, especially uh, this was, these were uh, thing, uh, investigations done in, I think, in Europe, maybe in the UK. And there was a lot of priests who had lots of doubts about the existence of a God. And yet they continue to act as priests. They still live the life of a priest, uh, pretending all of these things, doing all the mass and all the usual things without really believing in God anymore. Uh, you can see this is the kind of problem we're talking about here. You don't really have faith in what you're teaching. You see the defects, but because you are attached to it, because it is about your livelihood, because it has an advantage for yourself, yeah? It says here, they see an advantage for themselves. They become dependent on that view, relying on an unstable peace. Yeah, you have this view in the world uh, that you present to the world, uh, you are dependent on that, you present it to everyone else, uh, but because it is flawed, uh, because it is not true, it is unstable. Uh, maybe things change in the world and suddenly you cannot hold on to that thing anymore. That view becomes untenable uh, because it isn't based on reality, uh, it, so it is unstable. Uh, and if you try to hold on to something that is unstable in this way, it's gonna cause suffering in the future. Uh, and this is why, as long as we know that our views are not certain, as long as we don't have the insight of a stream enter, you should never hold on to the views too strongly because they are unstable. They are uncertain. They will be challenged at a certain point. And then you will suffer because of that. You're grasping on, you're taking hold of these views in the world. Then the Buddha says, it is not easy to get over dogmatic views adopted after judging among the teachings. That is why among all the dogmas, a person rejects one teaching and takes up another. Yeah, we try to uh, look at the various views in the world and then we take up one view. Yeah, maybe we become a Christian or a Muslim or, or whatever it is, or a Hindu, or a Buddhist, or whatever. And very often we just take the view that suits us. We take up the view that we feel good about. Okay, you be decide to become a Christian. Well, why do you decide to become a Christian? Well, because my parents are Christian, or my friends are Christians, or because the Christians have supported me at some point in my life or because, because Christianity is so easy. You just have to believe. You don't have to do all this hard work that you have to do as a Buddhist. Yeah. So one way or another, it feels good to you. And so you judge these various teachings based on the very uh, shallow foundation. And then you grasp on to those teachings as a consequence. And sometimes you reject one teaching and you take up another. Yeah coming from that. But uh, the way the people who are cleansed, the cleansed one, these are the arahants of the world, yeah? they have no formulated view in this way, yeah? in all the world about the various realms, uh, having given up illusion and conceit, uh, by what path would they go? They are not involved. So the idea here is that if you really see the nature of reality, uh, you have no need to hold on to views anymore. You know the reality of the world. You don't go around formulating the views and holding on to things because you have no illusion. You have no conceit, I am. You have no need for a view to support the feeling of who you actually are. You're not walking along any particular strange path. When they say by what path would they go, they mean like the wrong path, yeah, to go astray. You are not involved in the world in the sense of arguing with people and all of these kind of things. For one who is involved gets embroiled in disputes about teachings. But how to dispute when someone is not involved? About what? For picking up and putting down is not what they do. They have shaken off all views in this very life. 
So when you don't hold on to views, you're no longer embroiled in the world. In the very last line here, it says that having shaken, shaken off all views in this very life, what does that actually mean? And uh, this is a kind of a very interesting li line because it seems to be saying that, uh, well, actually, we shouldn't have any views at all. But that actually is the wrong understanding of this last line. I'll come back to that in a second. But uh, before we come back to that, let's just have a quick meditation to clear our minds a little bit, uh, do a bit of questions, and then I'll come back to this last line afterwards. Uh, questions later on uh, so we are just looking at the, uh, the very last verse here. I want to comment a little bit on, more on the last verse because I think it is uh, important and I was running out of time a little bit before. So uh, again, it says for one who is involved gets embroiled in disputes about teachings. Yeah? The, I, the point here is this idea of being involved, involved implies attachment, uh, involved implies craving for things. Uh, it, in, it implies that you make a self out of this, yeah? This is the idea of being involved here. Huh? And as long as you have this kind of involvement, uh, then you dispute because you're holding on to your views uh, and that is the problem. But if you're not involved, uh, if you not crave for these views, uh, if you don't attach to the views, uh, yeah? then how can you have an argument with a person like that? And you will notice that, that there are some people in the world, it is very hard to have an argument with them, yes? If you try to have an argument with Ajahn Brahm, have you tried that, to have an argument with Ajahn Brahm? He's not going to engage with you in an argument, yeah? He may discuss a particular point, he may present the teachings, but it is impossible really to have an argument with Ajahn Brahm. Or you meet some of the other pe great people in the world, like I, who I really enjoy meeting, like Ajahn Ganha. You cannot have an argument with Ajahn Ganha. He will just smile <laughs> and he will go back to his kuti and do some meditation or whatever. But he's not going to have an argument with you. But he will, if you want to have a chat with him and you want to listen to what he has to say, of course, he will have a chat with you. It's impossible to argue with these people. They don't argue. They're not interested in that. They don't have anything to prove. Yeah. They know the truth and there's nothing for them to prove. And um, then it says for picking up and putting down is not what they do. Yeah, they don't have views that they pick up and put down because they have penetrated, have understood the reality of things. They are finished with the idea of picking up and putting down things. Picking up is like upadana, yeah, the a factor of the um, dependent origination, upadana literally means to pick up. You pick up views, and then once you have picked them up, you hold on to them. They have shaken off all views in this very life. So shaken off all views, what it actually means, it means that we don't attach to views anymore. That is what it means. It doesn't mean you don't have any views, because we know from the suttas that the Buddha had views. The Buddha teaches right view. Right view is an insight into reality. Yeah? In the suttas, when you become a stream mentor, you are called ditti patto. Ditti means view. Patto means attained. So you have attained to the right view. You have attained view. In other words, you know the truth, the reality of things. Yeah? That is what the uh, person who is uh, a stream mentor becomes. Uh, so we know that there is such a thing as right view, uh, but you don't hold it. Uh, and you don't have to hold it, you don't have to grasp it, because you know it is the reality. And then you are no longer interested in arguing with anyone else in the whole world. And this is why when you become a stream mentor, you are independent. Yeah? You are independent because you know the truth. You don't actually need anyone else to, to tell you what reality is. And this is why when you see a stream enter, very often they will do what no one else does. They will not be afraid of going against the stream. They will not be afraid of going against what other people do because they have that independence. They know what is right. They know how to live in the right way. They know the truth. And so they have that independence as a consequence. So that is the sutta about views. 
And I thought I would just bring it up because we have been talking so much about right view. It is also useful to remember that uh, views should not be held very strongly because if you hold them too strongly, it just leads to all kinds of problems. So what then is the right way then to think about something like rebirth? Just to give an idea, we're just talking about rebirth before. What is the right way to think about that? So we know that rebirth is a right view according to the Buddha. But if it is a right view, how can you not hold on to it? What does it mean not to hold on to it? And what it means is that um, if someone challenges you about you know, whether there's a rebirth or not, uh, you don't make the idea of rebirth part of your personality, uh, part of something that is so important to you that if someone else challenges you about rebirth, uh, you get into an argument with them. Uh, that is where you go wrong. Uh, yeah? It also does not mean that because you don't hold on to the idea of rebirth very strongly, it does not mean that if someone else argues with you, that you let go of it very easily. It does not mean that either. Yeah, because if someone else argues with you, what you have to remember is that the other person probably knows even less than you do. So why should you listen to their ideas if they know even less than you do? That doesn't make any sense either, right? So it doesn't mean that you should take on the views of anyone just because you are not 100% clear about your own views. In fact, chances are that your view is correct because you are aligning yourself with the Buddha. So don't give up those views just because someone else disagrees. What it means is simply that when we have a view about the world, we don't hold it in such a way that we end up arguing with other people. If someone wants to argue, let that be their problem. You still have the view, but you don't hold it in such a strong way. This is what it really means. And then we are kind of uh, uh, dealing with these things in the good way. Then we have the view that supports our practice. Yeah, And we have uh, one of the suttas I was talking about before was the importance of having right view to support the meditation practice. This is the way to have that right view that supports meditation practice. And all of these things that I've been talking about so far, how to look at the world, yeah, looking at the world in the right way, how to think about other people so as to avoid getting angry and all of these kind of things, all of that goes into the idea of right view. And when we have that kind of right view, then meditation becomes possible, especially when that right view also includes sila, it includes Kindness includes living in the right way, because then we have the support of all the sila, all the support of feeling good about yourself, together with the right view, which directs the mind in the right way. That is when meditation becomes possible. So what we're going to talk about now is meditation practice.